because we only learn something, know something, when our brain cells grow, when they change. Nobel Prizes were, run, were won uh, now 15 years ago, showing that the only way we log in things in our brains is if we grow our brain cells, if, if, the, if the connections get healthier. <clears throat> I began this, this part of my journey really at the Boston Marathon, uh, trained in Boston, grew up during that time of Bill Rogers when everybody was running. And then we began to see people who had to stop running. And uh, for the first time in their lives, many of them, and they got depressed. They got uh, anxious. Uh, and then a lot of people showed up with attention deficit disorder, which led me into a whole career writing about attention deficit disorder on people who really hadn't had any problems with attention. They were very successful in, in academia, in business, in uh, entrepreneurship. They were, uh, but, but they had to, when they stopped exercising, when they stopped running, they had trouble. They had what we call adult onset attention deficit disorder. That led to a whole series of books with Edward Hallowell, the, the major one being Driven to Distraction, which a number of people have already mentioned to me today. It, 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 it began to show me that, hey, moving has a lot to do with our brain health. And in fact, now we know that even more. Uh, I really got riveted to this notion by learning about this school back in 2003 in Naperville, Illinois. Uh, it, was, it was on the front line uh, talking about the obesity crisis. 33% uh, of our kids then were overweight. That school, 3% of their children were overweight. They didn't have one kid in their high school of 75, two schools, 7,500 kids, not one of them were obese. Why? Well, they had started an exercise program, a physical education program, uh, 20 years before, and involved this amazing program where they had PE, or physical education, every day. And what this led to was uh, everybody participating. They used this brilliant move way back using heart rate monitors so each child would work against themselves. And I, but anyway, this led me back to the past, to look at evolution. How did we get the kinds of brains that we have? Well, we were hunter-gatherers for anywhere from three to four hundred million years. We were moving around the plains, around the savannas, we were moving all the time. Uh, it's estimated we move anywhere from 10 to 14 miles a day. No one was training for triathlons. No one was working out at the gym. You had to be. You had to be moving. You had to be lifting. You had to be climbing. You had to be swimming. You had to be on your toes. You had to be, you had to be present all the time because that's what life was about. Uh, and, and things have changed. Uh, quite radically, but during those 400 million years, our brains grew, and they grew from this area, the red blotch area, the, the, the motor cortex, forward. We added on this part of the brain as we became better and better movers, better and better targeting, predicting, sequencing. Uh, running programs in our head. We got a bigger RAM chip, so we had more working memory. Uh, we, we could switch, switch strategies uh, about being better movers, and that helped us adapt to changing conditions, and eventually those same nerve cells that we evolved to be better movers, we co-opted and used them to think with. So they're the same cells, so the moving brain is really the internal, or the thinking brain is really the internalization of the moving brain. So when we move, we are activating the same cells that we think with. However, today we're not, we're not moving much. We're, we're sitting. 
we're really sitting and killing ourselves and our kids especially in those classrooms in those cubicles uh, we were following the Prussian uh, model in 1850 uh, fill, fill, up, fill the kid up with information test them keep them in their seat everybody pay attention everybody be good uh, and that's the wrong way to do it plus our, our work is is mainly sitting in front of screens uh, <clears throat> but now we know that that exercise and we know this because of science uh, we have have had a, a tsunami of papers that have come out since the mid 90s about how exercise affects our brains how it helps emotionally regulate our brains our, our, and, and our psyches as well as how it optimizes our brains, our, our cells, to learn and to grow. <clears throat> and this all started uh, south of here, down at uh, UC Irvine. Uh, Carl Kottman, who was a professor of neuroscience, was a member of a team working in a big MacArthur grant across many, many countries in the late 80s, looking at what were the things we knew prevented the onset of cognitive decline and Alzheimer's disease. There were three of them. Well, the first was optimal weight. The second was continuous learning. And the third was exercise. Now we sort of figured the first two before that, but exercise was like, what? How could this be helpful? After they factored out its effect on the cardiovascular system, on blood pressure, on stroke prevention, on that, it still was the most robust uh, finding that this was the biggest uh, thing that we could be doing to prevent uh, cognitive de decline and Alzheimer's disease. So there became a, 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 a wait a minute, let's, let's go back. So, so what Carl did, and this is what's exciting uh, to me, it was exciting to me in 1995 when I read the paper in Nature. What he did is he got a bunch of mice and he taught them to run in running wheels. He did the mice SATs first, had them run in these running wheels, which they like to do, uh, for a, a week, week and a half, retested them, their scores went up 20% on the mice SATs. And their brothers and sisters who didn't have the running wheel, they stayed the same. He then looked at their brains. Their cortex, the top part of their brain, was thicker. And there was one part of the brain called the hippocampus, which was bigger. This was exciting. He didn't believe it, so he did it eight more times before he published a paper. He, he, and, and all the time he, he found that these facts were there. He also measured a substance called BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic factor. Probably a lot of you know that term, or know that uh, the, the phrase, because it's so important. It is truly brain fertilizer. We only knew about it in 1995 for about 10 years. Now everybody in biotech knows the term, because we want to try to make it, or make the, 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 the substance that's going to turn on the genes to make more of this BDNF, because we want it because it does so much for, the, for our brains. Uh, it, it actually has such a powerful effect on preserving our brains, but making those brain cells ready to grow, ready to change, ready to react, and also help us with our moods, help us with anxiety, help us deal with stress. All the things that we need to do going through life. So that uh, we think today, as I mentioned, the brain is a muscle. And the more we use it, the better it gets. And we want to use it the most uh, that we can. And that's where exercise comes in. Because when we have our brain cells linking up with one another, we, we build scaffoldings and then we build bigger scaffoldings and, and, and bigger connections uh, and that makes for a, a bigger network so we learn better and we and we nail it we remember it we put it in another 
fact that it came out of this work some years later at the Lana La Jolla at the Salk Institute, well, we learned that we humans were making new brain cells every day. We're making new brain cells every day. And is this the first time that anybody's heard that? No, we're making free, we're losing brain cells, but we're making new brain cells every day. And and we we especially in an area of the brain called the hippocampus, the area of the brain that's a sort of central station for memory and learning. It's also now we know it's very important for controlling stress and anxiety uh, in the brain because this is where cortisol binds. Uh, and we make new brain cells from stem cells every day. Uh, and exercise promotes this fact, promotes this activity better than any other uh, activity or better than any other medicine that's been tried. It makes makes us to have more brain cells in that area, and a lot of them go on to become functioning brain tried. cells. And there's a big argument between a lot of these researchers saying, if we learn anything new, we really have to have a new brain cell to to, to hold it in in our hippocampus. John, but what level of exercise does one need? Yeah, no, no, that's good. You go ahead, please interrupt. Uh, that's your job. But uh, <laughs> it, it, what level does it need to? Everybody usually asks that at the end. They say, "What level? How much do I have to do today?" Which means, how little do I have to do to get the effect? <laughs> but really, uh, it. it it, it's, it's one of those answers that everybody hates. It depends. We don't know. And, I mean, if you, if you begin to uh, change the, the chemistry of your body and your brain uh, to a certain point, and then you get these, uh, this whole procedure to get turned on. Uh, and even lifting weights, doing yoga, doing Tai Chi, doing meditation even, which is a very active brain process, you, you have similar kinds of uh, act, uh, findings. Uh, but nothing really outdoes something like aerobic exercise. Uh, <clears throat> then we began to learn that depression causes not only a decrease in our, in our brain's neuroplasticity, but actually led to erosion of our brain cells. We shrink our brains when we're depressed. So that's one of the reasons why we target depression to say, okay, don't get depressed. If you get depressed, get out of it quickly. And I saw a guy just the other day who, who was depressed, had been lying in bed, a young guy, and he started lifting weights just because he thought it was a good diversion. But lo and behold, he felt so much better, and he continued doing that and doing that and doing that. And so he worked himself out of depression. There's a great book out now uh, in this chapter, and it's called Walking Off Parkinson's Disease, where this guy had Parkinson's, has it had it for 30 years, but he walks very strenuously every day, and he doesn't need to take medicine. You, so you can, you can begin to change your brain. You can begin, in this case, it's depression, uh, and this is uh, the, looking at a, uh, the normal hippocampus part of the brain of a, of a mouse. This is a stressed or depressed mouse. You see the difference in cell structure, cell numbers. They go away. We, we, we retract, we erode brain cells with depression, with high levels of stress, with anxiety, with aging. Uh, we knew a long time ago, 300 years before Christ, Hippocrates wrote, what's the best way to treat depression? Well, he said, go for a walk. They come back and they, they still were depressed. He said, go for another walk. Keep on walking. Just walk. Just move. Get going. And, that, then, and we, we've known this, and we've known this throughout the years, but it's only been in the last... Uh, few years that the American Psychiatric Association has included exercise as a treatment for 
depression, in part because we now have the science. This is a study done at, at Duke University Medical School who has led the way in looking at the effect of exercise on all of our psychiatric psychological issues, where they showed that exercise was as good as Zoloft, was as good as our antidepressants in treating mild to moderate depressions. It took, takes about the same length of time and it lasts. It lasts over, this is a four month period, the depressions in both cases, in all cases, uh, decreased to the same amount. Well, of course they were criticized by all the hard scientists saying, well, you didn't have a placebo group. So, 10 years later, they did another study with twice as many people and found the same results with a placebo group. In other words, it had the same effect of getting sedentary people to move. If they got them to move, they got undepressed. We know this now epidemiologically from many studies. If you're moving, if you're exercising, if you're playing, if you're doing yoga, or if you're doing Tai Chi, if you're uh, walking your dog, you will prevent, uh, you more likely to prevent the onset of depression and anxiety. Uh, and you turn on the parts of the brain that are, that makes us most human. The front part of our brain, the very tip of our brain, uh, the prefrontal cortex, which was the last part of our brain to evolve, where we have most of our major functions that you all use all the time. To take in new information, to parse it apart, to sequence it, to switch it, to flip it, to bring in other pieces of data, this part of the brain is, is so important, and when we exercise, we're always turning that part of the brain on. So again, the brain evolved to help us be better movers, and those parts of the brain are still with us. Also, we're, we're learning, we're drilling down. We're learning about what we do uh, <coughs> to the brain when we exercise. This is a, a, a paper that came out last year looking at what kind of new brain cells are we making in the neuro uh, for in neurogenesis in the hippocampus. Well, there, uh, a number of them, or a, a good portion of them, are what's called GABA cells. GABA is the brain's brake. And what they do in the hippocampus is they put the brakes on our stress response. They like automatically, without our thinking about it, without our being aware of it, just calm it down. So this raises our stress threshold. <laughs> We're able to, to withstand usual stresses, and it takes more stresses for us to get uh, uh, to go into the fight or flight or to, or to get stressed. Um, and then we have a problem uh, as 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 our brain uh, really uh, uh, begins to uh, shrink when we're overweight, when we get metabolic syndrome. It hastens the onset of uh, not only type 2 diabetes, which is a, a big epidemic today, uh, especially as we age and we get heavier, but it is really hastens the onset of cognitive decline and Alzheimer's disease. And so some Alzheimer's research groups call Alzheimer's disease diabetes type 3. It's so consistent with uh, having our, our glucose out of control. And, of course, this is the way we tend to think of exercise today. This is a 24-hour fitness uh, uh, place in San Diego. Um, but to show you, I mean, this really took off first because we really were interested in preventing Alzheimer's disease and present, preventing cognitive decline. So the Mayo Clinic Department of Neurology, now three years ago, looked at over 1,600 papers, scientific papers, looking at the effect of exercise on cognition. They were universally positive, preventing the onset of cognitive decline, improving scores on uh, various kinds of tests, no matter what the age, 
but really recommending firmly that the way you want to prevent the onset of uh, losing your mind is to keep moving. And if, you, and if you if you're not started to start and stay with it. And then a number of studies have come out showing a miraculous kinds of changes. This is a, a looking at 50 brains of six, average age 69 year olds of people who were sedentary. They got them to start walking three to four times a week, getting their uh, on a treadmill, getting their heart rates up to about 75% of their maximum at the peak, or their maximum heart rate, and then retesting them. Their elderly SATs only went up about 11%, but these areas of the brain that are blue and yellow here are areas of brain growth. In other words, in the six months that they were in the study, their brains grew as opposed to continuing to erode and retract, which you see uh, normally. So, <clears throat> I said I'd talk a little bit about attention deficit disorder, and uh, here's my lead-in slide. Uh, but uh, here's my dog who, uh, when I got him, I took him to the vet, and the vet said, put him on Ritalin now. Uh, and instead of that, I got him on a very intense exercise program. I uh, had his hill in the backyard, I'd take him out every morning and had three tennis balls. Threw one up, he ran up and got it, came back down, was never going to drop it because he's a terrier. But I had two others, so I flipped another one up and he ran up and got it, came back down, and then repeated this process for about 15-20 minutes. And he was ready to, you know, to, to handle the day without getting in trouble because he was a troublemaker. And uh, this is what uh, he could do. <laughs> what, what, what we found is called the Jack Effect uh, on helping his attention uh, so that he could pay attention and control his bad behavior. And other times when there wasn't any time for uh, exercise, he resorted to his no. madcap way. <laughs> you got a picture uh, now, uh, the icon for ADHD today is Michael Phelps, who at the age of 11 or 9 was diagnosed with ADD, put on Ritalin, helped a little bit, but it wasn't until he started swimming three to four hours a day that he could stop the Ritalin and he went on to do all the great things that he's done. And you also might know what happens to him when he stops training. He gets into trouble. He needs a lawyer. Um, <laughs> but <clears throat> so all the brain, the fun is good the brain, for the brain is made for us to be better movers. So when we're moving, we're using so much more of our brain, but especially this front part of our brain, the executive area of our brain, that helps us do all the things that, are, that we value most as being human. To uh, plan, organize, put the brakes on, not respond to impulses, uh, and so forth. So, and this is the area we see as problematic with people who have attention problems uh, that they often don't. And this is where our medicine works uh, to uh, affect this part of the brain. Uh, now, we, a lot of you out there will say, well, I, I'm not exercising, I haven't exercised, I'm not going to exercise, I'm too old. This uh, shows you that really uh, two examples of how evolution has made it possible for all of us to start and go with it. On my left is Ernestine Shepherd, who at the age of 56 was obese all of her life. She was a couch potato. She started. She decided she was going to get fit, so she started running, and then she went to the gym. There she is at the age of 74, uh, winning another body beautiful contest. Even more impressive is Mr. Singh on my right, who at the age of 80 had never exercised. His wife died. 81, his son died. 
he got depressed. He went to the doctor, and the doctor said, start running. So he did. There he is, finishing the Toronto Marathon at the age of 100. Wow. Yeah. He retired last year on ESPN, finishing the Hong Kong Marathon at the age of 101. Woo. And my, my sense is he was like Forrest Gump, just turned around and said, I'm tired. <laughs> But anyway, businesses have gotten into it. They've gotten into it. This is a, a, a cartoon that was in the Harvard Business Review back in 2008, uh, talking about the boardroom of the future, where the, the execs are not sitting around a table talking, they're on their treadmill with their tread desk uh, to uh, come up with the company strategies, et cetera. As of last year, on Amazon, there were a hundred different tread desks available. A hundred. Uh, people are using them. Yes? It was interesting. I was just at the Marriott International at their headquarters this week, and they actually now have new meeting rooms where they've set up for smaller meetings where they've done this. They've done this, yes. And Google apparently has done this a long time ago. It, 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 in, uh, one of the Googlers told me. And uh, Richard Branson doesn't have any chairs in his meeting areas. Everybody's standing or walking. Uh, so you see, this is a, an incubator lab at, in, uh, at Cambridge, in MIT area, where everybody's standing. They're not sitting. Pardon me? Diet. Diet's important, uh, very important. Uh, diet, especially for obesity, it's, it's very important. But diet is, is, is things we eat that really affect our brain. When you're talking about neuroplasticity, sugar is toxic. Too much sugar is toxic. That's why I'm an anti-sugar person. Um, you know, we, we've been saying for Sorry, years Nolan. to our patients, don't eat anything white except cauliflower. You know, because white means you got you got uh, starch or sugar in it, and it too much of that is toxic, and we all take too much of it, and it it it's killing us. And it also leads to early erosion of our brain cells. Uh, but things that are useful to promote uh, the neuroplasticity. Or one, have enough vitamin D, for sure. Two, omega-3s. Three, cinnamon. Four, turmeric. Turmeric. Put cinnamon and turmeric in my coffee every day. As well. They promote, it promotes neuroplasticity. They promote neuroplasticity. So, and, and it said that one curry meal per week will give you enough antioxidants for that week. One curry meal per week. One curry. And, and part of this goes to the, the <laughs> looking at the percentage of Indians uh, in the villages who don't get Alzheimer's disease, which is very small. And part of it, they think, might be due to their having curry all the time, a, a staple in their diet. Now, creativity. A gal up at Stanford a few years ago and Prof were saying, you know, they, let's have a walking meeting. So they went out for a walking meeting. And then they said, let's study it. So they did. They got about 120 uh, first year psych students and tested their creativity while they were sitting. And then while they were walking. Okay, you interrupted me. Good. Uh, <laughs> but what they found was a 20 to 30 percent increase on creative ideas while they were walking. You know, we used to, I mean, Plato, Aristotle, the Greeks all had walking meetings. So you're saying those hikes that we do on Sunday is a smart idea. What's that? The Sunday hikes are a 
Oh, the hype you're having is a great idea. Not, not just to, 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 to make the bond more. And I skipped over a slide talking about oxytocin because when you're moving, you, you create oxytocin, which is the love hormone, the bonding hormone, and it also promotes uh, neuroplasticity. But when you're, when you're exercising together, that's the best thing to do, by the way. Those kinds of things are the best way to exercise because you'll come back to it because it's meaningful. And it also charges the brain more, uh, demands more for your brain in a good way to be on a, on a hike with, with friends or doing something with a friend. And the more complicated it is, and if it's outside, Omega three. those are the, the criteria for the best activity outside with somebody, having fun, something you'll return to, something you'll lose yourself in. So you... See? <laughs> Thank you, Ken. Yeah. Now, I go, most of my work is with schools, to try to get the schools to, to change, right? And that's hard because we have 50,000 school boards in the United States with 50,000 different views. Uh, but we have evidence that, evidence from, this is a slide from this 2004, I think, but from 2000 to today, we have slides like this. We show, and this is under California, we, we, where we evaluate a million kids every year on what's called a fitness gram. And uh, the number of fitness standards achieved versus their scores on math and English tests. Every, every fitness uh, standard you achieve more, your score goes up. And we have plenty of evidence all over the world individually and in large groups and when we go into a school and get them to have an exercise program and especially if we start off the day with it the first thing that we see that happens is a drop in discipline problems not because they're burning off energy as most people would think but because they're turning that front part of the brain on that puts the brakes on their brains are more activated uh, we did the same thing in Charleston, South Carolina. The first slide was from Kansas City, Missouri, where we, we had these kids just for an, uh, 30 minutes playing vigorous games in the morning. And we saw an 83% drop in discipline problems in the first four months. 83% drop. So the teachers loved it. They had students to teach. They weren't just policemen in the classroom. And the scores went up, et cetera, et cetera. Now, when we exercise, we turn our brain on, and, then, and this is the points I'll leave you with. We turn our, turn our brains on. This is looking at 20 kids just sitting and doing a QEG, looking at the electrical activity in their brains. The same 20 kids went out for a walk for 15 to 20 minutes, came back, sat down, re -put, put on their uh, quick or the QEG machine, and we see this different colors. And the colors indicate the level of brain activity. So just by walking, you're turning your brains on. And this is what's important because you turn your brains on and they're ready to learn, ready to take in information, and also control the, the uh, impulses that they're gonna come up to, to move, to talk, to, uh, uh, do wild and crazy things. So we can affect the brain with exercise or by using our pharmacopoeia, by using all the medicines that uh, I as a psychiatrist use and use all the time. Because exercise, but because we drive the brain to act, we cause them to make more and release more norepinephrine, dopamine, serotonin, all kinds of other factors. But these are, the, these are the neurotransmitters that we in psychiatry have been in love with and all of our medicine is directed to. And we do the same thing as, as our medicine does. 
So I've, I've said for a long time that a bout of exercise is like taking a little bit of Prozac and a little bit of Ritalin. Uh, yes? Uh, could you speak for a moment about uh, neuroplasticity and meditation, please? And, the and meditation? Yes. Yeah, no, I, meditation does a, a very similar thing. Uh, it get, gets your brain ready to, to, to learn. Uh, because meditation is a very active brain process, and that's what people miss. It's not just shutting down everything. It's a very active process, more active than, than reading Proust. Um, <laughs> now, so, so exercise increases our, our norepinephrine, which is very important, and our dopamine, our serotonin. Uh, and two factors, uh, two hormones that you, you, you've heard of. One, which is the endorphins, most people know it, but the endorphins are endogenous morphine. And then the other is the endocannabinoids. If you live in California, I mean not California, but if you live in Washington State, Colorado, you know what cannabis is. Uh, we have our own marijuana receptors. We have our own marijuana producing cells in our body and in our brains. And they, it works very similar to the endorphins, to the morphine, the endogenous morphine. It, it stops pain uh, sense from coming. It helps us feel better. It helps us feel more satiated. So when you're done exercising, you have all these things working for you, uh, as well as the, 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 the great miracle grow, uh, which also has a big part to play in, in making our, our brains in a state of equilibrium. Uh, as well, as I mentioned, oxytocin, and this is where the walk comes in tomorrow. I'm going to interrupt you. Yes, uh, this is, we make more of this oxytocin so you feel better about being with people. You feel closer to people. This is, you know, for those of you who don't know, when the baby's being born, mom gets flooded with oxytocin. Because here she looks at that infant that comes out who's just put her through hell, and she's madly in love with that infant. And that's partly because of oxytocin. And uh, does all kinds of nice things physiologically, but psychologically and bonding. It's a bonding hormone. Okay, I'll ask, answer questions. Go ahead. How drastic does alcohol and marijuana use counteract some of the healthy activities we're doing to promote? Well, it depends on how much. Uh, the question is how, how does alcohol and marijuana counteract it? Marijuana, the problem with marijuana versus the endocannabinoids is that when you take marijuana in, it, it's fat soluble and so it stays in there for a longer period of time. The marijuana that we make, the endocannabinoids that we make, are quickly metabolized. So they have their action and then they go away. <coughs> but if you continue to have that, you continue to feel too good, it's going to lead to your forgetting things, your procrastinating, your uh, uh, losing motivation, the amotivational syndrome, all those uh, can and do occur. There are other questions, yes? Uh, is there a best time of day to exercise? Yeah. Best time of day? I. I think the best time of day, my personally and I think statistically, the best time is in the morning when you get up because you get an arousal factor. It arouses you for the day. It puts you on to the right course for that day. Uh, and uh, But you can do it anytime. And there are people who say, oh, you shouldn't do it after dinner. That's, you shouldn't do it two hours before bedtime. But two hours is not, not a long time before bedtime. So. You can do it in the evening, and it doesn't interfere with sleep. So, uh, but it, if you do it in the morning, you get all that jazz for a, a, a period of time in the morning, and that puts you on your way for the day. So, uh, table tennis has been called chess at 90 miles an hour, because it, at high levels, it has intense physical and mental exertion. Speaking of ping pong night, which is great. Have you had experience in... Oh, plenty of experience with, with table tennis, yes. They're, they're studying it in Taiwan and in uh, China to, to look at its effect on things like attention deficit or disorder, like executive function, which is what we're talking about here. 
uh, in terms of the front part of our brain. And it really does, because you get your heart rate up pretty high when you're playing ping pong, when you're playing table tennis, especially if you're good, because you're moving around, you're, you're having to react quickly, you're throwing your arms out like that, so all that has a, has a big effect on, uh, on your brain. What's the difference between neuroplasticity and neurogenesis? Neuroplasticity is the bigger, it's, it's the meta group. It means your brain's ready to grow. Your brain cells, your 100 billion brain cells ready to grow. Neurogenesis is we make new brain cells to add to that mix every day. It's a big difference. Let's go Cyrus. Sir, um, one of the points that you made is that exercise, one of the key things is it leads to increasing test scores and benefits in school. This is very close to me, myself and a part, uh, another member here, Dr. Mark Woolston, have created a program that ties on various things to improve performance and test scores. I agree with you that uh, physical education is one component of improving parasympathetic tone, but there are others. And to say that it's either exercise or medicine is a disservice to everyone here and to uh, the academic community. There are other things like Albert Ellis, rational emotive behavioral therapy, and other ways that you can image to control your fight or flight response, your animal mind function, and focus shift over to your human mind. Do you have a question or are you heckling? No, 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 it's not heckling. <laughs> <laughs> it's not heckling. <laughs> the question is, in addition to this, are there other things? One thing that you mentioned are like brain games and other things to improve diet. Are there others that you have as a list of other things that you can do besides just exercise? Well, my, my, my interest has been in exercise because it's, it's the simplest uh, there. But certainly anything that, where you're training your brain to control itself is better. It, it, it like you mentioned, the uh, continue, uh, <coughs> brain training of sorts, you know, to use a different part of your brain. Sure. That, that's going to that's going to be a benefit, but the on the broad spectrum, looking at you know a, a country or a, a city or a, a big school district, exercise really is a, a great way to. I like when the answer is actually shorter. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think they're all interesting and are all very futuristic. And my favorite smart drug is modafinil. I don't know yeah, whether people no, sure. know about that drug, but it really. Oh uh, yeah, no. It's it, it's called Provigil or New Vigil, and it's prescribed for narcolepsy. But boy, it keeps you up, awake, alert, and improves your ability to take in information and improves your mood, improves your attention. Anybody got any? No. How safe is it? The problem with it, 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 it was, it was, it, it was developed, it was bought, brought over uh, to the U.S. by the mafia, a uh, mafia company, and they still have the pill uh, pegged at about $11 a piece. Uh, you know, so it's, uh, it's a problem. <laughs> Even though it's a great problem. Is it worth it? I don't know, it could be. <laughs> No, you can get it at the drugstore. You can, you can get a prescription. Why is it not right. over the counter? Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> I think it's on the website. Hey, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the website. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's give it up for John.